Peace be with you. Friends, I love how all three of the readings for the second Sunday of Lent call to mind the mystical, the strange, the transcendent world that's the goal of all of our religious striving. Our first reading from the book of Genesis talks about the covenant that the Lord makes with Abraham. He has to cut these animals in two and then all these this strange darkness descends and this, this flame passes through the severed pieces of the animals. A voice is heard. All these symbols are meant to evoke this mystical and strange higher world with which Abraham is having intercourse. In other words, it's never just a question of what goes on within this realm of our experience, but we have a relationship to this higher reality which is summoning us. Then the second reading from Paul to the Philippians. Let me just read a little bit to you. But our citizenship, he tells the Philippians, is in heaven, and from it we also await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen now. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body. Extraordinary lines, aren't they? In the very beginning of the church, when there are a handful of Christians around the world, but Paul speaks with this extraordinary confidence that, you know, our citizenship, even though we live in this ordinary world, and he's thinking about the culture of you know, ancient Rome and so on, but we don't have our citizenship here. Our citizenship, where we really belong, is in heaven. From heaven we await the, we await the coming of the Lord when he will conform these lowly bodies of ours to be like his own glorified body. Huh. What does that mean? Well, I don't think we, <laughs> we really know. Elsewhere, Paul talks about a spiritualized body. Our same body. I mean, he's, he's a Jew. He wasn't thinking of souls escaping from bodies so much. That's Plato. He's a Jew. He's thinking of, I mean, me. I, I am my body. But what we await is a glorification, an elevation, a perfection beyond our imaginings of this lowly body of ours. Okay? With that kind of mystical consciousness, we should turn to the famous gospel reading, which is Luke's account of the transfiguration. Now, say what you want about these stories. Say what you want about this event that inspired them. It fascinated the first Christians. And, and it has continued to fascinate Christians up and down the centuries. The story of Jesus' transfiguration. The Greek behind that term, so transfiguratio would be a Latinization of the Greek, which means metamorphosis. He was metamorphosed before them. That means, morphe means, means form, meta, beyond. He went beyond the form that he had. Huh, what does that mean? I don't think we entirely know. But something so strange happened that this, this ordinary Jesus from Nazareth, look, he certainly said and done extraordinary things at this point, but he looked for all the world like anybody else. You know, he's a physical human being and wearing the clothes everybody else wore. There was nothing remarkable about his appearance. In fact, do you find this intriguing? I always have. Nowhere in the New Testament is there any reference to what Jesus looked like. Isn't that peculiar? Odd, isn't it? This, this figure of supreme importance to them. There's not one reference to, to what he looked like. Well, I mean, clearly he was an ordinary man of that time and culture. Except at this moment. Except here on that holy mountain when he was metamorphosed. He went beyond the form that he had. Can we think caterpillar butterfly? I know it's a kind of hackneyed image but a metamorphosis of this kind of lowly grub, this lowly critter, becoming this splendid uh, butterfly. Something happened, something happened that so impressed them that it, you, you, see, you hear it reflected in these stories and it's impressed Christians up and down the ages. 
Let me just give you a little hint here of how they tried to describe it. While he was praying, his face changed in appearance. What does that mean? I, I, don't, I don't know entirely. His clothing became dazzling white. It's different. It's as though his deepest identity became clear, became transparent. It's as though the divinity within him shone through his physicality, that that very physicality was elevated and changed and res became resplendent. His glorified human body was on display. That seems to be what they're talking about. I love how Thomas Aquinas said that the purpose of the transfiguration was in the midst of this kind of slog through Jesus' public life, you know, which had glorious moments to be sure, but also had a lot of struggle and opposition, and that during that slog, the disciples got this glimpse. Ah, that's who he is. That's what he's finally about. And that's, dare they dream it, that's what's in store for us. That our bodies, as Paul says, might be transfigured too. What we're talking about here, everybody, is the glorified body in heaven. The goal, if you want, of the spiritual life. Now, now look, I, I came of age after Vatican II, and everyone and his brother and sister put a huge stress on the this-worldly dimension of the faith. And fine, are there implications for social justice and concern for the poor and making this world a better place? Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. However, however, show me one text in Vatican II or anywhere else in our great tradition that says the church is only about making this world better. No, 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 no. The church from the beginning has been fascinated by this perfection on high to which we tend, this properly supernatural goal that's held out to us. And these, uh, these readings in their own way, and it's, it's lovely as we are going through kind of the slog of Lent, that we get a glimpse, too, of this. Okay, with that in mind, I want to look just really briefly at the way St. Thomas Aquinas describes the glorified body. And you say, oh, isn't he just sort of wildly speculating? Well, no, it's based upon texts such as this and also the text about the resurrected Jesus. But also, how wonderful that, that we are thinking about what life will be like on high. And, and these readings prompt this meditation. Okay. Here's the first quality, Aquinas says, of the glorified body. It has identity. That means it is, in some very basic way, in continuity with these bodies here below. Now, think for a minute, everybody. This body that you see <laughs> before you, well, is this the same body I had when I was five years old? Well, yeah, in a way, because the, the form and structure of it remains, but heck, every cell, molecule in my body when I was five is different now, right? They're, what do the scientists tell us? They're, they're replaced completely every, I don't know what it is, several months or years. The point is there's a kind of discontinuity even in this life. But yet I say, no, that five-year-old, Bob Barron, who was, who was you know, playing baseball back in Birmingham, Michigan, is the same one standing before you now. There's identity, even though this body is also radically different. Well, so in heaven, there'll be a continuity with this body, but yet a great difference, an elevation, a transformation, a transfiguration. Aquinas says, will people be able to recognize us? Yeah because it's the same body, but again, think caterpillar butterfly. <laughs> you know, I'll be myself, but myself at such a higher pitch of, of perfection. Here's the second um, uh, trait he thinks of the glorified body. He calls it quality. That means the glorified body will be at the height of its powers, possessing a full integrity. You know, it, it's, it's all of us as we get older, you reach a certain point in life where you're kind of at the height of your powers, and then, let's face it, the powers begin to wane. 
we weaken. We, we lose our capacity. I mean, I remember quite vividly when I could still play uh, football and basketball at a pretty high level. Um, get me out there on a basketball court now? Forget it. I mean, those powers have kind of waned. I'm satisfied now with a, with a round of golf. It's because I don't have the physical power I used to have to run up and down a court. Well, in heaven, Aquinas says, there'll be no loss of these powers, but rather we're at the highest pitch. And then thirdly, relatedly, the glorified body, Thomas says, has impassibility. That means it will not change or diminish. So as I say, it's one of the sadnesses of this life, and every poet and <laughs> novelist in some ways talks about it, is that I, I, I change and I, I diminish. I, I lose what I have, but no, in heaven, in the glorified body, at the full pitch of my power and integrity, I don't lose that. I, I, I retain th this perfection of being, impassibility. Fourthly, Aquinas says, this beautiful idea, the resurrected body will have agility. And what he means here is very specific. He means that the body will be able to respond utterly and perfectly to the promptings of the soul. So think, I mean, right now, my body is responding, if you want, to the promptings of my soul. I'm, I'm imagining a, a goal, I'm, I'm willing it, uh, and then I'm, I'm instantiating it through the movements of my body. Okay, so I've got agility, and I can, please God, in a few <laughs> minutes, I can, I can walk out of this place back to my car. I've got sufficient agility to do that. But this body of mine can't do everything that I want to do, everything I imagine. I mean, heck, I like to play basketball like you know, Michael Jordan. I like to swing a golf club like Rory McIlroy, but I, I can't do that. My body can't respond with perfect agility to the promptings of my soul, but Aquinas says in heaven, it can. You know, his justification for this is um, the resurrected Jesus who can, yes, even pass through walls, Though the place where they were, they, they were locked in for fear of the Jews, we hear, Jesus came and stood in their midst. That's the agility of his resurrected body, that we can respond in the wink of an eye to the most extravagant yearnings of our will and imaginings of our mind. That's agility. And then finally, Aquinas says the resurrected body has clarity or luminosity. Claritas in his Latin. And how wonderful it's correlated to the story of the Transfiguration, that Jesus became dazzlingly bright, the, the light of the Transfiguration. Why is it, this is true even across the cultures, why is it that we associate holiness with light? Why we put halos around the heads of the saints? Why is it that in lots of stories of holy people, light is associated with them? There's that wonderful story, Malcolm Muggeridge, the man who, who really uh, brought Mother Teresa to the consciousness of the world, that when he went to film in her place there where she cared for the sick and the dying, the lights failed, the lights they had brought failed, and, and his producer said, you know, it's just not going to work, let's not do it. And Muggeridge said, no, no, no just go ahead and film anyway, let's see what happens. And when the film came back, they were astounded because there was this luminosity all through the room that allowed them to film perfectly. What was that? But, but some anticipation of this claritas of the resurrected body. I, years ago, met this uh, older man who, when he was a young kid in the army, World War II, had heard about this Italian holy man, Padre Pio, and he went with a buddy of his and they went to serve his mass. And he said to me, and, and his eyes filled with tears as he told the story. He said, as he lifted the host up, he said, Father, believe me, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't dreaming. All around his, his hands and around the host was, a, was a, a bright light. It's the claritas, the luminosity of holiness. And so our resurrected, glorified bodies, luminous with the holiness of God. Think on these things, everybody. As we're making our kind of tough slog through Lent, think of these things. What God holds out to us, eye has not seen and ear has not heard. And let that give you hope. God bless you.
Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel.